Okay, so hello Insomniac and welcome to my talk about uh, VirtualBox security. Um, just a quick reminder what VirtualBox actually is. Uh, it's a product developed or maintained by Oracle um, that essentially lets you run uh, all kinds of modern operating systems inside virtual machines, uh, very comparable to, say, VMware Workstation. Um, but it's open source and free, so that's nice. Uh, just a quick intro of myself. I'm an independent security researcher, sometimes studying. I d um, I'm interested in reverse engineering and exploitation. I did Pondo own last year, and then I was very happy to hear that they added VirtualBox as a target this year. So that motivated me to look at it again and come up with a new exploit. But unfortunately, I can't present that today because the bugs are not fixed yet. Instead, I will be talking about some research I did last year. Um, all of the bugs are already fixed. Uh, I love playing CTF. Um, I play usually with the team easily pwn repeat. And uh, together with some, uh, some friends, I started the blog last year about, um, let's say, uh, zero days and browser exploitation, which you can find at uh, phoenix.re. If you want to contact me, Twitter is probably the best, uh, best option. And I should also point out that some of this research presented uh, was sponsored by the security team Secure Disclosure Program run by Beyond Security which can be found at this link. All right, so why do we even want to look at hypervisors or VirtualBox in particular uh, in terms of security? Well, we all know that VMs are very useful for developing software, testing software, debugging, especially kernel debugging, but it's also useful as like a certain means of isolating dangerous code, let's, let's say. Um, so for example, if you want to analyze the behavior of some malware, you probably don't want to run it on your host to find out what it does. And instead, you might decide to like, run it in VM, assuming that it's kind of safe to do so because it's an entirely different operating system and can't really affect your host system. Um, but there is definitely some attack surface that could allow for dangerous code in running inside a VM to break out of it. And we know that some competing products like Hyper-V and VMware, uh, they've had quite some bugs, bugs in the past that were published. Um, both of them, no, well, one of them has a bug bounty program. The other one has been a target at multiple exploit competitions so far. So we know that there's been quite some research, quite some interesting exploits um, that allow uh, guest code to, uh, to escape to the, to the host. Um, but both of them are closed source and they're kind of hard to reverse engineer and people tend to use fuzzing because there are no really, no, uh, not a lot of symbols available. And in comparison, VirtualBox is really good uh, because it's open source and you can read everything. You can really understand in depth how features are implemented, how uh, device drivers, uh, emulated devices are implemented. So it's really nice to like, learn about hypervisors uh, using that code base. And also for exploitation, they're quite nice, um, especially VMware and VirtualBox, because they're quite far behind, say, modern web browsers when it comes to exploit mitigations. So you will definitely not find something like CFI or sandboxing in, well, maybe in Hyper-V, but not in the other two. Um, so it's kind of a state like, from like two, three years ago. So if you find issues, they are often exploitable. And you can re make impactful demonstrations. Um, also, it's fun to play with hypervisors if you want to learn about low-level I.O. and uh, programming and kernel programming. Because more often than not, you will have to write parts of your exploits or parts of your proof of concepts as kernel drivers because you need access to low-level hardware, um, emulated hardware in this case. Uh, yeah. So if you're interested in low-level stuff, it's a cool way to get into it. All right, so I will start out my talk by giving a short overview over the architecture of VirtualBox and then introduce you to the, let's say, the three uh, most important privilege boundaries that there are within VirtualBox, one of which is kind of unique to VirtualBox and not that well known. Um, and then I will like, give you examples of bugs that can occur in uh, each of these boundaries that allow you to cross them. So this is a very high level overview over uh, the architecture. I put the host and the guest here side by side, um, although Obviously, in the real world, the guest is like inside the host, but it's hard to visualize. So let's just assume the server client uh, type architecture here. And then uh, both in the host and the guest, we have the typical separation between user and kernel land. Uh, 
Um, and I think the most important part is the. Uh, wait, what did I do? Uh, whatever. What? <laughs> okay, so maybe I can't use this. Maybe somewhere here. Uh, so let's say this here is a host process um, called VirtualBox.exe, uh, which is in the user land of the host, and you will have one of these for each VM that you run. So every running VM will have one of these processes, and they will make use of a kernel component called a VBox driver. What the hell? Um, and use, uh, use an interface provided by that driver to implement the low-level functionality. Um, so we definitely have a privileged boundary here, and it will be interesting to see um, if we can draw, cross that to, to do privilege escalation on the host. And on the guest side, we also have uh, user and kernel land. And if we install guest additions, then there will be an additional kernel component called VBox guest, um, which is a kernel driver running in the guest. And maybe that exposes some functionality that we can use to escalate privileges inside the guest. And then, of course, we have the most interesting boundary, which is between the host and the guest. If we cross that, then we get a VM breakout. And most of the interfaces there are just your standard low-level I.O., like memory mapped I.O., port read writes. Um, the, the devices are typically exposed via PCI, and they speak protocols like VGA or USB. But we also have at least two VirtualBox-specific protocols here um, called HGCM, um, Host Guest Communication Manager, and HGSMI, Host Guest Chat Memory Interface, and these implement VirtualBox-specific functionality. Um, okay, so first we're going to focus only on the left side of this diagram. So we're just going to ignore the guest for a second. And we want to know, can we cross this boundary from the user land in the host to the kernel land, thereby obtaining a privilege escalation inside the host? So can we, as an unprivileged user, on a machine where VirtualBox is installed, can we make use of this VBox driver uh, to escalate privileges? And yeah, for that, for that I have to like, explain a bit what this driver actually does. Um, so it essentially it implements all of the functionality that needs to be implemented in the kernel, such as uh, the virtualization, uh, VM enters, VM exits, um, low-level memory management, uh, low-level I.O., essentially everything that cannot be handled in user land. But this interface is pretty weak. So it has had a couple of issues in the past. So you will have, in that kernel driver, you will have your classic memory corruption issues. I know this is probably hard to show because of. All right, so, oh God. Hmm. All right, so th this is a bug report by um, by Jan Horn. Oh, no, it doesn't work anymore. Okay, uh, this is a bug report by Jan Horn from Project Zero. I'm just going to read out the important parts now because I can't mark them. Um, it says. This I.O. control called VMMR0, it takes a kernel pointer as an argument, and then it uses that pointer to load and store various kernel registers, including RSP, which is the stack pointer, from this essentially attacker-controlled uh, location. So, of course, if we can control uh, the RSP register in the kernel, we can probably turn that into code execution somehow, and then we have code execution in the kernel. So if we can do that from an unprivileged context, then that's a privilege escalation. Um, but Oracle says this is not a bug, because you should not be able to get a handle to this VBox driver in the first place. So their threat model is they want to protect this, ha this, this driver itself. So you, you're not supposed to get a handle to this driver. Otherwise, you can do all these kinds of things, and they know about them. So they don't even try. Um, there is another issue, which is there are some data structures that are mapped in both user and kernel land, and they have kernel pointers inside of them. For example, here we have two versions of this VRAM pointer. One is suffixed with R3 for ring 3. One is suffixed with R0. And the R0 version is used by the kernel, but it's writable by the user land because it's also mapped there. This is, by the way, um, a, a data structure that, is, that captures the state of the VGA device. Uh, and there's plenty of examples of this. And if you change this, this ring 0 pointer from user land, the kernel might do interesting things with it. 
And there is even much more direct ways to get code execution uh, using this driver. So really the bottom line here is you don't want anybody to be able to access this driver in the first place. Um, okay, so, but how can this work? Because um, if you start a VM as an unprivileged user, well, if VirtualBox is installed, everybody can start a VM and create a VM. And if you start a VM as an unprivileged user, it will actually run as an unprivileged user. So the host process will run as the user that, that started it. Um, so so how, can it, how can this even work? How can they then make this, this driver not accessible by an unprivileged user? And the way they do it on Linux is, uh, if you look here at the second output, um, you see the permissions for the, for the VBox driver device. It's owned by root and it can't, access, it can't be accessed by anybody else. So only root can open a handle to this, uh, this, this file. And then the VirtualBox process itself, uh, it is uh, also owned by root and it has the set UID flag set. So it will, the first thing it will do when it starts is it will open a handle to VBox driver and then it will drop privileges back to the user that started the VM. And after that it's just an unprivileged process and it can't open the device anymore. Uh, but it, of course it has somewhere in its global memory it has a point, uh, it has this file descriptor stored. Um, so in the last line you can see a running process and you can see that it's actually running as an unprivileged user but it has this handle open. And the good thing about using a set UID for this is that on macOS and Linux this will actually prevent the simple means of getting code execution, uh, injecting code inside this process. Um, just for, uh, for security reasons. So you can't use ptrace or the equivalent uh, debug, debug API on macOS to inject code into it. Because if you could do that, then you could get this handle out. Um, on Windows, this, this protection mechanism is much more complicated because they have to implement it completely them, uh, by themselves because there is no equivalent to set UID. So what they do is if every time somebody tries to open a handle to this driver, the driver itself will check well, what's the process name of the process that wants to open um, a handle. Is it signed by Oracle? Uh, is it called virtualbox.exe? Uh, is it in a trusted location? And only then will it allow the handle to be opened. And it will also install a lot of hooks that prevent uh, like your standard code injection techniques, like create remote thread and similar. Um, and they also hook the DLL loader so that it will never even try to load any unsigned DLLs. And there is, there is a very good overview by James Forshaw from Project Zero, uh, Project Zero about the implementation of this. Okay, so if we somehow bypass this protection mechanism then we, uh, and then get code execution in this protected process, we can get a handle to VBox driver and if we have that then, um, then we will see that we can uh, achieve a privilege escalation. So how has it, how has it been done in the past? Um, well, there's your old school like environment poisoning where uh, in 2017 Jan, Jan Horn reported uh, two similar issues uh, on Linux. Uh, one was based on uh, an environment variable uh, that Qt uses to load additional plugins. So if you set that, you can make it load shared libraries into the process. You can get the handle out. Um, there is a similar issue with uh, the ELSA config file. It can also be made to load additional shared libraries. And James Forshaw found like several bypasses for the for the implementation on Windows, which is even more complicated. And all of these are described in the blog post as well. Now some other ideas that I had of additional attack surface that you might look at if, you, if you're interested in uh, this kind of exploit is well there is a lot of files that VirtualBox stores on disk and then parses again later. Some of them are binary formats and I'm pretty sure if you mess with uh, some of them uh, you can probably like get memory corruptions inside the parsing process which is the, the protected process. And there is also a programming interface uh, based on COM which allows you to make method calls and interact with the VM. And I will show you an example of a bug there uh, in a while. And then every VM escape is also automatically a privilege escalation. That sounds weird because VM escapes sound much more powerful than that. Um, but maybe you have a VM escape that only works in like a very obscure configuration. But then what you can do is you can create a VM with that configuration 
exploit it, and then uh, then essentially from the inside you can exploit this protected process again and achieve a privilege escalation. Um, one example of such a, uh, uh, an obscure configuration, which is actually not that obscure, is if you enable 3D acceleration in your VMs. And the documentation says, well, you should never do that um, if, if you don't trust the guest, because amongst other things, enabling 3D acceleration enables a lot of additional program code in, in the VirtualBox host process. And it even says which it might be used, uh, might be able to use to crash the machine, uh, the virtual machine in this case. And that's very true, actually. Just this year, they've, uh, somebody just reported uh, a bunch of bugs in that component, and they're just trivial integer overflows uh, that lead to heap buffer overflows. Some of them are even stack-based buffer overflows. Probably the, at least some of them are pretty easy to exploit. Um, so if you exploit one of these bugs, you also get a privilege escalation. And there's definitely more. So I have reported some more, and I know of at least some other, uh, one other person that reported some more of those. This code is from 2001, so it shouldn't be that surprising uh, that there is lots of issues with it because there haven't been nobody's really looked at it since, and only now in 2017 and 2018 people start to look at it. Um, so. Okay, this is probably very hard to see from, from the back. Um, this is a bug I reported in uh, one of the COM methods. Um, it's called set credentials, and you just give it a username and password, and it will store those, and later it can auto log in the guest operating system using those credentials. And it just takes your username and password and string copies them into a fixed size buffer on the heap. So, yeah you would hope to not see that in a modern code base. Um, and also you would expect the compiler to be smart enough to mitigate that because it knows, in this instance, it knows exactly uh, how large the buffer is. So uh, MSVC, uh, the Microsoft compiler, and GCC, they both add like bounce checking. But for some reason, Clang doesn't. So the macOS build was vulnerable and it was fixed in January. So I decided to, uh, to write an exploit for that to demonstrate a full privilege escalation chain using that. Um, one problem here is that this buffer is at a constant location because it's allocated exactly once at startup and you can't reallocate it later. So we have to be, uh, get a bit lucky and be able to overwrite something afterwards that's interesting. But turns out in about 30% of the cases, if you just send this username, which is a bit too long, you will get this crash. So you can see here it crashes at the address 0x4242422. This is actually not, this is a memory access where it crashes. It's not rip control yet, um, but it crashes at, uh, while accessing this address, and that's just the last six characters of the username that we passed. Um, and, and what this actually does is we overwrite a pointer to an object, then it uses that object to fetch a function pointer, and then it calls that function pointer with the object as the first argument. Um, so that's quite a powerful primitive. So if we can somehow fake an object somewhere and make it fetch a function pointer from there, we get uh, immediate control over the, over the um, code execution. Um, yeah, so one thing to point out is that we don't actually have to defeat the uh, normal ASLR of all the libraries because they're all in every process on macOS they're in the same location so we can just look in our own process where is some function loaded and then we know where it's in the target process as well and um, in order to place a, a known payload at a known address um, I just used an old trick that's also quite well known on macOS um, it's just very poor at randomizing uh, mmap allocations so if we just allocate a lot of memory inside the guest, uh, like one gigabyte, then one of these pages will up, end up at this address. And then we just use a gadget that uh, loads a lot of registers from our, from our object, and we get ROP, and then we get code execution. Here on the right you can see uh, that my shell code is executed at the, uh, somewhere in this fake object. Okay, so now we can 
now we have this handle to the VBOX driver. And I haven't really told you yet what to do next. And definitely the easiest way that I found is just use the API that does that. So there's, a library, uh, there's a, an IO control called loader load. And it's used to add plugin code to the running kernel driver. So if you install, say, the extension pack for USB support, it will just add a plugin to the already running driver. And it does that by using that API and just passing it the driver that it should load as a memory buffer. Um, yeah, it, on macOS it does no additional checking. So you just take any of the existing modules, you change the entry point to contain your shellcode, uh, you give it to this function, and then it will execute it in the kernel. So that's probably a bit too easy. Um, and on Windows it's a bit harder, but also possible. Um, there it will actually check that the driver that you give it has a valid signature. But there is a lot of already existing drivers, and maybe we can use one of those signed drivers and reuse some of its code to our advantage. And for that we need another I.O. control which is called call service and it allows us to call a function inside uh, a kernel plugin. And uh, for that function call we control four arguments I think and the last one is a 64-bit integer so we fully control it. So we just need to find a gadget that jumps to that register. And there is plenty of those. R9 is where the fourth argument will end up uh, being stored. So we just, use, uh, we just um, specify this jump R9 uh, gadget as the function that we want to call. And we immediately get control over the uh, RIP register for the program counter. Um, we're not completely done yet because on Windows, at least on modern uh, Windows 10, you can't just jump into user land because of SMEP. So we need to somehow get some interesting code into the kernel. But that's also easy because there is other I.O. controls that let us allocate executable code in the kernel and write to it. So we place our shell code there, and then we jump to it. And then we again have uh, kernel code execution. So this is the full exploit uh, for macOS for version 5.2.4. Um, so I'm starting, it's probably also hard to see, I'm starting out as an unprivileged user. Then it creates a VM, it starts the VM, it runs a, a, a heap spray inside the VM, and then it triggers the bug and we end up with a root shell. All right, so let's look at the, let's look at the right side of this now. So ignore the host for a moment. We have this weird additional driver called VBox Guest, which is installed if you install guest editions. And we're interested if, if we can maybe abuse that to uh, do interesting things within the guest. And probably the best thing to do would be to escalate privileges from user land to kernel land inside the guest. Um, so why is this even necessary? Um, so a lot of the features that VirtualBox has require cooperation of the guest. For example, mouse pointer integration, um, shared folders where you make a subset of your file system accessible to the VM, uh, clipboard sharing, drag and drop, and even this, uh, also this notorious 3D acceleration. And most of these are implemented using the HGCM protocol, um, which is just a very simple uh, function, a remote function call protocol. Um, so the guest can make they can allocate a request buffer with some arguments, and then a service on the host will, um, will handle this request and copy the response into the guest. And if you want to, sp to, make, uh, to use this protocol, you need to make a request to the VBox guest kernel driver. And it will then package it properly, uh, notify the host via some emulated device uh, so that it can get handled, and then it will give the response back to you. So this is what the role of this VBox guest driver is. Um, and there's a weird, uh, there used to be a weird uh, bug in that that I, well, that I, I don't quite know if it's really fixed yet, but I think at least the examples that I gave them uh, why this is bad are fixed. So if you look at the devices that are exposed by this kernel driver, 
It's actually two. One is uh, called VBox Guest, and the other one is called VBox User. And VBox Guest is not accessible to the world, only to root and a user named VBox Add. But VBox User is actually accessible to anybody. And by that I mean even to unprivileged processes running inside the guest. And they essentially implemented the exact same interface with almost no distinctions. So everybody can just open this VBox user device and make arbitrary HGCM calls, thereby reading and writing arbitrary files to shared folders, even if they're not mounted, um, setting clipboard contents, reading clipboard contents, initiating drag and drop, um, all kinds of things that you wouldn't intuitively think should be possible from that, from that context. And especially the, the shared folders are problematic. And one example I gave Oracle that where this could be a problem is if, you, if the shared folder is actually mounted inside the VM, which it probably is because otherwise why would you have it in the first place? So let's say it's mounted as root. Um, so what we can do as an unprivileged user, we can just uh, create a shell via, H, uh, via an HTCM call in that shared folder. I mean, it, it will then appear in this mount point because it's, it's mounted. So we essentially just bypass all of the Linux file system permissions inside the guest. And then we can even chmod, or we could, now we can't anymore, but we could just chmod that and add the, set the set UID flag. And then if we run it, we get a root shell. Um, I'm just going to skip over the second one, but the last one is, I thought was fun. So there is a feature called memory ballooning uh, where the guest can essentially tell the host, uh, so this physical page of memory I don't need anymore. You might as well use it for, uh, or assign it to some other VM uh, or use it for yourself. Um, this is essentially just a way to like, save a VM memory. But this was possible from via this VBox user device, so everybody could do it. So everybody could just say, look, I don't really need this physical range that corresponds to the page tables of my system. And then the host would just unmap that and map a zero page there. And let's just say the operating system is not going to have a very fun time afterwards. So it just crashes immediately. And so you dust the guest from inside the guest. Um, so when I told them about this, they essentially just got rid of this VBox user device in the next release. And I thought that was quite a good patch because maybe there's other examples where this could go wrong. Uh, but then they noticed that, well, for some reason, some of the, their features actually used this. So that's probably why it was there in the first place. Somehow they didn't catch that during their testing at all. And then people complained that 3D acceleration doesn't work anymore. And then they just undid the patch. And instead they fixed like, these individual issues that I gave them as examples of why this could be a bad idea. But you can still read and write files and everything, and I think it's still kind of unintuitive. But it's not technically a security problem. I guess it depends on how you look at it. All right, so uh, this part is now going to be about the real fun stuff, which is escaping a VM and getting code execution uh, on the host. Um, so we're looking at this privilege boundary right here now, and we want to see is there any, like is this interface attackable somehow? Is there code that like parses, like guest provided values um, that, that could have bugs and then maybe you can achieve a memory corruption in the host? <coughs> so essentially we can, we can think of the hypervisor here as a server and the guest as a client that uses hypervisor functionality and manipulated, manipulates its state uh, via the emulated devices that are exposed to it. And there are multiple devices that are usually available. So you'll always have the virtual machine monitor device. It's what handles all the HGCM protocol and other virtual box uh, specific features. And you will always have a VGA device for graphics. And depending on what guest operating system you use, you will have um, one of two audio devices attached. And then depending on your network configuration, you will in most cases have an emulated E1000 network card. Um, but if you choose to use Word.io net, then that is not there. Instead, it's, you have para-virtualized um, networking. And then you can also choose to 
uh, use NAT together with your uh, E1000 network card, which means that all the traffic gets tunneled through the host. And there is an extra library that handles all this translation. So that's also a text surface. And then there are some other things like storage controllers. That I think, I think not a lot of people have, have looked at these. Like USB, I don't know if anybody has ever looked at the implementation. So there's lots of opportunities to get creative and like read some code and maybe find some more bugs in there. Um, so these are the most important examples of full VM escapes that I know of from last year. And as far as I know, it, it's only last year that people really started looking at VirtualBox. Um, so from before that, I don't know a lot. Um, well, except for 3D acceleration, because everybody's always attacked that because it's so easy, uh, starting in 2014, um, and now in 2018 as well. And it will be, uh, it will keep keep on giving, I'm sure. Um, yeah, and, and Jan Horn from Google Project Zero, he looked at some components uh, last year. Uh, he found like, a path traversal bug in the shared folders where two VMs could essentially cooperate um, by racing uh, a symlink, and then they were able to uh, together to to break out of out of uh, out into the uh, the host file system and not just the sub uh, the subdirectory that was shared. And he also found a heap buffer overflow in the net library and uh, another heap based bug in vertio net, which is non default. And he wrote exploits for all of these uh, exploits for all of these. And somebody else looked at the E1000 network card and also found uh, a buffer overflow in there. I think it, it was inside a bigger structure, so he would then overwrite an offset and then get a heap memory corruption from that. And I think he also at least wrote a pretty good proof of concept. Not sure if he wrote a full exploit, but it's probably exploitable. And then towards the end of last year, I reported two very similar bugs in the VGA device uh, that are essentially just read arbitrary memory read writes in the whole address space of the host. And I want to show you now the, this, uh, these last two bugs and how I, how I exploited them. Um, yeah, so aside from HGCM, you also have another protocol to do uh, host calls, which is HGCMI uh, for host guest shared memory interface. And the way it works is that there is a shared memory buffer between that is both mapped in the host process and in the VM, and it's it's called the video RAM. And if the guest wants to make an uh, HTCMI request, it will allocate a buffer in that shared area. It will then put its request there, tell the VGA device at what offset the request is, so that it can then go on and, and parse the request and pass it on to the to the correct HTCMI service. And there is only uh, currently, I think there's only one HTCMI service which is the VBVA um, subsystem call, uh, f short for VirtualBox Video Acceleration. And um, one of the things that it implements is something called virtual um, video DMA. Um, so the guest can tell the host to copy data around inside of the VRAM. I don't know why this is necessary, and actually I think none of the client code actually uses it, so it's just dead code. But it had really good vulnerabilities so, and it's been there for six years. So maybe there used to be uh, some some guest code that actually used them, but now it's just good for exploitation. Um, so this is one of the bugs, and the other one is very similar. Um, you, yeah, it's probably. Let me just put this here. Maybe you can at least see see this in the top right. So it just takes a bunch of guest controlled values as offsets into the VRAM. It doesn't do any checking, and then it mem copies data around based on these offsets, and the size is also controlled. So you f it's a mem copy where you fully control the source and the destination and the size. The only problem is that it's relative to the beginning of the video RAM buffer. But it can be before or after it because it's a 64 bit offset, so it wraps around. So it's really good primitive. And now by copying data out of the VRAM inside of it, we can leak information. And by copying data from inside the VRAM out of it, we can overwrite stuff that's out, outside of the VRAM. 
but we still don't know where this VRAM is actually located in the host. So ASLR is still an issue. And now the question is, is there anything surrounding this, this video RAM buffer or can we place something around it uh, that's interesting, uh, that has interesting pointers or that, we, that would be interesting to corrupt? Um, one way to do this is a heap spray. Um, I haven't actually tried this uh, back then and I think it would work. Uh, instead, I just looked at what's immediately after the video RAM and by pure luck, there is something there that's really interesting. But only on Windows. Um, so this is a memory dump of, uh, of what's directly after the video RAM. So I'm dumping memory here. Well, the, the video RAM is mapped at C5D0000. And then I'm mapping what's after it. And you can see there's actually a pointer to the video RAM directly after it. And the size is also somewhere in that region. So that looked pretty good already. And then I tried to find out what data structure that is. And it's called a memory uh, MMIO, MMIO range. And it contains all kinds of interesting pointers. It contains a pointer to the VRAM. It contains uh, the size of the VRAM. It contains a pointer to some uh, context data structure for the VGA device. And it even contains a pointer into a, a DLL. So we already defeated ASLR with this as well. Um, so what we do now is we just read all of these uh, pointers. Then we know where the VRAM is. So now we have, now we can do an absolute read and write because we can, um, well, so we can just always subtract the VRAM and then use that as an offset. And we can, so we can now read and write memory from everywhere. Um, we already defeated ASLR because we leaked a, a module base. And now we just need, uh, need to chase some pointers to find kernel 32. And we find a function pointer that's worth overriding. And there's a really good one that we can trigger via VBVA. Um, and this is code that's normally not called, so we can, if we overwrote this pointer, we can then call this and trigger it. And the function pointer here is called PFN VBVA guest capability update. Um, so we just overwrite that with our own po uh, own uh, code pointer, and we we uh, we pivot into a rob chain, and then we get code execution eventually. All right, and then after we get code execution, we run a, we uh, run a privilege escalation payload using the trick that I showed you before, and then we get system level code execution, and we can even repair everything so that the VM keeps running. And I will just show you a live demo of this right now. All right. So first of all, um, I added a kernel driver to this guest uh, that gives me some con low-level control over the video RAM and uh, the H HDSMI calls. So this exploit requires having root in the first place inside the guest. Yeah, and then uh, then we just leak, uh, leak the, well, we, re we can, we can uh, learn the size of the VRAM, then we leak a couple of pointers, then we write some shellcode somewhere, and then just for, good, like, just for added tension, it will just wait 20 seconds, and then hopefully afterwards it will uh, give us a shell. All right, so now we have a, a shell on the host, and this doesn't even need networking. Networking is completely disabled in the VM. It's tunneled through the video RAM, uh, no, and we're system, and now we can pop calc, and now we run to an, uh, into a sophisticated security mitigation that was added to Windows 10, uh, where they don't allow you to spawn a calculator as a uh, system anymore, <laughs> and I don't know what this even means, and you can't click on the button, so it's weird, but an even more sophisticated attacker might then just pop something else. For example, for example, Minesweeper. All right, so, and now, uh, this is probably also hard to see, but now it, it, this runs as system, and you can see that it's a sub-process of virtualbox.exe. Uh, 
Yeah, and the and the VM still works. Um. Um. All right, so I have, I have a bit more time so I can show you something else. When I looked at VirtualBox in the very beginning, I thought I found a really cool bug in VirtualBox, which actually wasn't. Um, and it was actually a bug in Vagrant. This is a wrapper around VirtualBox. And what I noticed is that you could, if you could create a symlink in a shared folder, you could then force that symlink to be opened on the host rather than on the guest. So you can then read and write every file on the host because you can just create a symlink to an absolute path. And it turns out the, the VBox, uh, the VirtualBox shared folder um, file system implementation even had a flag uh, where it would, that would force that behavior. So if you're root in the guest, you can just do this and you can read and write files on the host. Um, and you can even do the same thing if you don't have any privileges inside the guest because of this VBox user device. Because you can, you can exploit all of this through HGCM. Um, but it turns out this is not actually a VirtualBox bug because they usually do not allow you to create symlinks on shared folders. And you explicitly have to set a flag to enable this. Which Raycon does by default and which you couldn't disable until recently. So if you're running uh, Vagrant, then we would also always be vulnerable against this. And their, solu uh, their solution is to just warn you now that you probably don't want this and you probably shouldn't run untrusted code in the guest. And if you don't want this behavior, then you should set this opt-in uh, environment variable that would prevent symlinks from being creatable. So, so if you're using Vagrant, you should definitely set that environment variable. All right, so uh, my conclusion is that VirtualBox is quite a nice uh, code base, actually. It's, um, if, you, if you're used to the, file, uh, the directory structure, it's kind of easy to find where stuff is implemented. Uh, it's pretty structured in that way. Um, and Oracle security response, in my experience, was pretty good. So they have this schedule where they only release security patches every three months. But usually, all the bugs that I reported to them, they fixed in the next upcoming release. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, VMware is not the only one who has cool bugs and can be exploited. Uh, so I, really, I think it's really cool that they now added VirtualBox to Pwn to Own. Maybe we'll see more VM escapes there in the future. Um, yeah, and aside from this, this VM escape, a privilege boundary, there's other interesting things to explore, like the process hardening. Uh, and that's maybe a bit easier to get into. There's several issues there still, for sure. Um, yeah, and if you want to have a secure VirtualBox installation, I would advise you to not even try on a multi-user system, because probably there's tons of bugs still there that allow you to privilege escalate. Um, you should disable all the features you don't need, especially 3D acceleration and video acceleration. And I think VirtualBox does a good job at making uh, the defaults kind of safe here. So if you don't use clip, um, drag and drop, it won't be enabled. So you have to actually enable it if you want to. Uh, same for clipboard sharing and shared folders. So it's a bit different to VMware in that regard, where everything is just on by default. Um, yeah, some of these bugs, or most of these bugs, are only exploitable from kernel mode. So it helps to have a secure guest OS and uh, do, uh, do privilege separation inside the guest itself. And if you're using Vagrant, uh, set this environment variable. All right, that's it from me. And if you have any questions, that would be a good time to ask. Any questions? <laughs>
All right, so if you think of anything later, you can probably find me somewhere and ask me in person as well. Okay. So thank you. Thank you.